The French Way, Chapter 11 Jean-Luc Lalande and Claude Fortin spoke both French and English. They displayed not a moment's hesitation concerning my addition to their travel party. We had become acquainted throughout the winter months, and they seemed to respect my standing in the Wyando tribe. Jean-Luc explained what materials would be needed. My Wyando family helped me acquire each item in haste. We left the camp in the canoe I had built with my own hands, the one that had earned me the Wyando name, to see. The village disappeared quickly behind the dense foliage. After a short time, the river began to widen and the unsettled expanse of forest unfolded before our eyes on either side of the river. A feeling of peace descended upon me as the rhythmic paddling echoed from the distant shores. Wordless hours passed as we calmly embraced the serenity of the nature surrounding us. The seemingly endless network of streams and rivers provided for days of safe passage to the southwest. Each day as dusk approached, we paddled to shore and found a place to set up camp. We would hastily gather dry wood for a fire and spend the spring evenings laying plans and exchanging stories while we enjoyed recently killed game or delved into our supply of dried foods. Jean-Luc and Claude shared many stories of their homeland and experiences since coming to the New World. They felt blessed to travel these majestic lands uninhibited by the laws and corruption of the colonial government in New France. Leaders of the city controlled all trade in and out of the city. They lined their pockets at the expense of the hard-working trappers who traveled the area surrounding the massive lakes. Like many trappers, they preferred to do their business with the Wyan dope and missions established by French priests avoiding direct contact with officials. During these peaceful evenings, bonds were strengthened between friends and decisions were made about the journey ahead. We would travel between two giant lakes to the south and return to the missions to trade when the burden of pelts became too great. Our path would eventually take us southward. The lessons learned in my time with the Wyando served me, served me well. To my delight, some of the skills acquired from my Wyando brothers and sisters were new to the Frenchmen. It brought great satisfaction to be a contributor, as my new friends and I learned from each other during our travels. The men were tremendously resourceful in the deep wilderness. The wilderness was home. Out of respect, they mostly spoke English in my presence. However, each began to patiently teach me the French language during idle time. Within a few weeks, we could have simple exchanges in French, which seemed to please them greatly. Reaching the shores of the lake called the Lac de St. Louis, Ontario by the Indians, brought great joy to my companions. Jean-Luc produced a bottle of rum from his supplies that we passed around in celebration. They explained that the streams and inlets off of this great lake would provide us with bountiful beaver pelts for trade. We had many encounters with other trappers. Some were French, but we also encountered various tribes of Indian trappers. They had cautioned me to allow them to do all of the talking in either case. How old are you, young Silas? Claude asked, one star-filled early summer evening on the shores of this massive lake. I hesitated in response, not out of secrecy, but out of ignorance. It depends on the current date, I rep replied a little embarrassed and feeling less informed than my companion. Claude seemed to be thinking this over, which put me at ease. After a bit of thought, he responded, My best calculations put us in late June, the year 1651. Jean-Luc was listening to this exchange with a look of curiosity. That would make me 17 years and then some, I responded with an air of confidence. Both men nodded with what seemed to be approval. Neither spoke again for several minutes. This was not out of character. They often digested information slowly and thoughtfully before continuing conversation, similar and perhaps influenced by the Wyan dote we had all spent so much time with. 
You are a worldly lad at your age, Claude offered. Would it surprise you to know that I have a beauty of a wife by name of Marie de Montreal in New France? This was a shocking admission to me, considering the knowledge that both men had Native American wives in the Wyandotte village. I couldn't help thinking how my parents would react to such a sinful admission. Before I could respond, Jean-Luc prodded Claude playfully. Now, if your purpose tonight is to spill out your soul to our young ami, friend, then complete honesty should accompany your confession. Beautiful may be off of the truth. Perhaps you should try a description more like godly or friendly. To this, Claude spit the swig of rum he had just taken into the fire and burst into raucous laughter. D'accord, or all right, Claude conceded. Compared to the Huron princesses, she has shortcomings. My purpose is to come clean and explain to our young friend our sinful behavior. Would the savages accept us winter after winter if we didn't prove our sincerity by living with their own? If we didn't show our abilities as providers and a willingness to accept their ways, we might end up in one of the huts in that graveyard. Can't say I ever considered that deeply about it, Jean-Luc admitted with a thoughtful look. It's just a better way to spend the winter than in a small cabin with you and your stench, he continued with a chuckle. Why don't you tell Silas more about this French une femme wife you're bragging about? Claude smiled broadly as he continued. Walking on the streets of the capital city, looking at the goods sold in them shops, I spied her through. No, 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 Jean-Luc interrupted loudly. How long did you know your lady before being married? What's her last name? The good parts of it, not the whole boring story. Well, you know that week with her before we married was the happiest of my life. Claude snorted, and just cause I don't recall her last name and use instead the name of the city where our love bloomed, don't mean we are not true, he protested. Imagine it, Silas. They met, married, and he left her all within a week. Not to mention the fool hasn't been back to see her for over two years now. I can't wait to get back there just to see if the pair even remembers what the other looks like. They'll likely walk right by each other and keep going, Jean-Luc teased. What about you, Silas? There were rumors a couple of the tribal squaws had their peepers on you. But you up and fled with us before acting on it. The two men stared at me with genuine interest. They clearly expected some kind of an explanation. I drew a deep breath and began. I once knew the most beautiful and witty girl. I told them the whole story about the first day we ever spoke and how Abigail materialized magically nearly everywhere for years, how she came from a family that was above mine, and the problem that created an English Puritan society, despite how people felt about each other. How she flirted and that she was my best friend. Then I shared the story about her sister's death, the betrayal, and my arrest. It felt good to put the story to words for someone who came from similar culture. The story concluded with the last time I saw her crying in the clearing while fleeing. The words she appeared to mouth across the pond before I disappeared into the woods. The telling of the story had become more about my needs than those of the audience. The telling had brought me temporarily into a dreamlike state remembering vivid details like the wisdom in her eyes, the softness of her skin, or the smell of her hair. Coming back to my senses, I glanced across the fire at my companions. Both seemed to have been impacted deeply by my story. They had glossed over eyes and a faraway look as they drifted through their own memories, possibly of lost loves. Another minute passed before Jean-Luc asked in a distant and seemingly far-off tone, Do you love her still? I don't think I will ever have a choice, I responded thoughtfully. Reflecting about the discussion later, 
I thought about Claude calling the Wyando, who were so accepting and kind to us savages. Briefly, there was a pull inside of me that made me wonder if my loyalty to the people who had been so good to me had been challenged. It seemed it would be foolish to take offense to this light-hearted discussion, especially considering how kind and sharing these two men had been since leaving the village two months earlier. It became clear that both men tolerated the Indians, but just as the people in the English settlement I grew up in viewed them as inferior, so did my French companions. Both men were enthralled by the Abigail story and frequently asked for the tale to be repeated on other starlit nights.